Pace. Welcome back to this series, guys. If you missed part one, you make sure to go watch that. We're doing an entire series on creative financing. In part one, we did this big overview. We gave some examples. We talked about all the things we're gonna cover in the series. It's kind of like a broad overview of creative finance, why it's so important. And again, below this video and in all the videos in this series, we'll have the playlist link so you really can go through and it's kind of like a library of creative finance strategies, A to Z, the whole thing. In part two, this video, we're gonna really talk about uh, structure and understanding the instruments, some of the vocabulary. Pace and I feel very strongly that we really can't dive into these techniques if you don't have a really good overview of how the instruments work together. When you really understand that, then it opens up an entire new world because now you can use these instruments to work together to really put together some amazing deals. Yeah, it's powerful. Um, for example, we had um, my first deal I ever did. Have you ever heard my first deal story? No. It's the most important story of my life. It was a cash okay. deal. Yeah. It's a, I'll tell it in three minutes. Um, somebody convinces me, go send out postcards. So I go send out postcards. I get three phone calls. I miss the first two. The third, the third phone call that comes in is a lady named Janie Munson. Okay, so Janie Munson, retiring school teacher, moving from Arizona to Oregon. These are important details, by the way. Okay, it's not always about comping the property. And this is the most, the most important lesson I ever learned in real estate was on the first deal I ever did. And it ties into what we're about to talk about. So Janie um, calls me up and I go, hey, this is Pace. And she says, I want to sell my house. Come up and take a look at it. I drive up there on the way up there. I call um, the person who convinced me to get into postcards. And I go, dude, what do I do? I don't even know what to do. <laughs> this is before you had, like your channel was like known. And so I, um, I go, what do I do? And they say, offer the lady $250,000 and I'll buy the deal. I go, okay. Yeah. I don't know what to say, what to do, whatever. So I drive up there. I meet Janie. We build rapport. We have a great conversation. And I go, so Janie, why haven't you sold the house yet? Great question to ask a seller, by the way. Yeah. Why haven't you, what, what's kept you from selling the house so far? Right, great question, write that down. It's one of the best questions you could ever ask. And, the, and she says, well, I'm looking for 280,000 and the highest number I've received is 275. And you're coming in there at 250. <laughs> yeah, with no, with no skills, right? No skills and not knowing creative finance, not knowing anything else. If I knew creative finance, I would have immediately jumped to a different number. Yeah. But again, I, guys, we don't start with creative finance. We start with cash. Always start with cash in a conversation with the seller because it gets you into the game, helps you build rapport, and gets you to understand what the other investors are offering so you can see all the pieces on the board. So here's what happens. She says, I got an offer at 275. I say, Janie, I can't help you. I'm so, so sorry, I wish I could help you, but I'm way below here. And she goes, well, give me your number. I go, I'm in, it, I would be embarrassed to give you my number. You're a school teacher, you're about to retire. Yeah. She goes, okay, well, let me show you out. So as I'm walking out the door, I turn around, I go, Janie, is there anything else I can help you with? I know I'm not, not, not buying your house, but is there anything I can help you with? She says, I'm confused. You wanna help me, but you also don't wanna buy my house. <laughs> and I go, well, I'm a, I'm a contractor, I have guys, I have resources. If you need help loading your truck, she says, I'm pretty good on that, but I do have a major problem. I go, okay, what's your problem? She goes, come in my backyard. So I go in the backyard and she shows me these three bunnies that are this big. Oh, this is the bunny story. The bunny story. I do know the bunny story. The bunny Keep story. going, this is a great story. So she shows me these Cadbury egg bunnies. They're, the ma ma mo they're like donkeys that look how, like bunnies. How many were there? Three. Okay. And so she goes, I need to rehome these. Somebody gifted them to us. There's sentimental value. My granddaughter is involved, the whole thing. I wish I would have known you then because my kids bred, bred and sold bunnies. I would have, see, this would have solved my problem, right? So what I did instead is I go, I, I'd be happy to help you. So who do I call? The most trustworthy person in my world? I call my mom. And my mom, who had a farm at the time, she was up at the property with me and Janie in less than 40 minutes with a truck, took the bunnies, and I gave Janie a hug and I left. Two weeks later- Solved Janie, her bunny problem. Solved her bunny problem. So Janie calls me two weeks later, and she's like, I have been waiting for your phone call for two weeks. And I was like, I, I don't understand. She's like, I thought you helped me with the bunnies so that you could manipulate me into selling the house to you. And I go, no, I just did it to help you. I'm, I, I can't buy your house. And she says, well, Pace, after two weeks of thinking about this, I wanna sell my house to you. Um, I don't even care what the number is. I wanna sell my house to you. And I'm like, blown away. I don't even know how to react to this. And I go, what did I do? And she said, here's what you did. You looked 
for what you could actually help me with. Nobody else cared about me, where I was going, what I, what I did for a living. Nobody told me about their favorite teachers they had in, in elementary. I told her about Mrs. Heredia, Mrs. Rose, my favorite teachers. We connected on that. We built rapport. I genuinely cared about what was going to help the lady, and I realized I didn't have the tool to, to help her. Okay, so number one, I could have helped her with creative finance easily. I didn't have that tool. So what ended up happening is I drive up to the property, I pay two fifty dollars for the property, I sold it to the, the next person, and I made $25,000. Yeah. And I drove away and I call the guy that I sold the deal to and I go, dude, I can't believe I got it for two fifty. dollars He goes, what did you do? How did you get the deal? And I said, I found the bunnies. Yeah. And he's like, well, I don't get it. And I go, I found the only problem she had and nobody else did. And so when you guys are going into these strategies, cash, creative, whatever it may be, you have to be looking for the seller's major problem. And it will be like an if this, then that type of scenario. So if the seller doesn't have equity, then it's gonna be a sub two. If the seller, so you have to find the bunnies. You have to find the problems in the scenario so you can use the proper paperwork, the proper strategy, the proper scenario in order to, to win this stuff. But I think, Pace, the, the bigger lesson I learned from that is that you truly do put people first. Always. It's people first, and that's what's made you so tremendously successful. Learning the mechanics of all of this stuff, you can learn. Right. But what's allowed you to really do creative financing well, and, and really all of your real estate investing and your coaching business, is that you connect with people and you care about people. It's not a technique so that you'll get what you want. It's not manipulation, so you'll get the contract. People feel that, that they'll map that, they'll right. read that. And so guys, I think the biggest thing, I hope you take away from everything I try to do, Pace for sure, what he tries to do is, if you really do have a servant heart and you really do wanna bless lives and make a difference, then you can win and make a lot of money and the seller win too. It's a win-win is a real thing. An attitude of servitude is what my mom always told me. and. Um, here's what was great about this. That first contract, I spent $5,000 in postcards. I got one contract out of it, so it cost me five grand. About 30 days later, I looked back at all, all my leads from that last month, and I saw a, a massive amount of people I couldn't help. And I was like, man, I found the bunnies in Janie's life, literally, but I can't find the figurative bunnies in other people's lives. These people want too much money. They're cr out of their mind. I used to tell people, I used to think people were out of their mind. And then I realized they just needed seller finance. Then I was like, man, these people don't have any equity. What the heck? How am I supposed to make any money? I can't help these people. They can't. And then here's what ended up happening. This is how I got into creative finance. I bumped into a lady. Um, she, her, her, she's epic. Eileen Brown. Have you ever done a deal with Eileen Brown? 48 years as an escrow officer, primarily around creative finance. So I go in, I open escrow on Janie Munson. And I'm having this, we do this deal. She sees I made $25,000. And um, Eileen Brown basically tells me, she goes, if you ever run into a seller that doesn't have equity or wants too much money, come to me. I'll help you walk through it. Mm. This, Eileen Brown changed my life. I took all these leads and I went to Eileen Brown and she taught me these instruments that Jerry and I are about to talk to you guys about. No deed of trust. All, the, all these things will help you solve seller's problems at such a high level. You need to truly understand the documents and yes. the terminology that are involved here in order for you guys to not only make money for your family, but to help other sellers. Because the last thing I'll say, and we'll get into this, it just is this, this important. Right now in Maricopa County, there are 20 people a day that get foreclosed on every single day, Monday through Friday, 100 people a week get foreclosed on in Maricopa County. I don't know what it is in your county or where you're at, but it's a lot of people. And the reason being is because the agent, the wholesaler, or other people that interface with these sellers did not have don't the Don't understand it. Yeah. They don't understand it. It's not just the creative finance. It's also the paperwork. All of those people involved. could have prevented that foreclosure. 100%. And, and been great and yes. done well and been okay and prevented foreclosure and a seven-year record on their... And, the, and it's not just even the, the, the record, it's also the psychological thing that the foreclosure. The displacement, yeah. It's like, I'm a failure, yeah. I'm, I'm a pariah. So like in my social circle, I got foreclosed on, I'm embarrassed. Imagine what that does to somebody's psyche for the next 25 years. It's, it's painful for people, right. yeah. Yeah, so preventing that. So let's, uh, and, and by the way, just one more thought I'll add to that is my Eileen Brown actually for me happened to be 
getting my real estate license and then later my broker's license because going through that training, it helped me really understand how all these instruments work, how deeds work, how title works. And so that allowed me to have such a deeper knowledge of real estate transacting that then allowed me to say, well, what if we did this and we put this together and we, we start to do some of these ideas here around creative financing and it helped me at such a big level. So however you're doing it, let's make this video kind of that overview, but really take the time to educate yourself on how these instruments work. Because the more you understand the instruments, the more creative you can be in how you structure deals. Right, and you gotta remember that human beings created these instruments in the first place. So you can take these instruments and use them how you need to, just like the human beings before us did. So yeah. first one I would say is that in real estate, people commonly misunderstand two different pieces of, of documents, okay? They, they misunderstand the owner of the property and they misconstrue it as the mortgage or the deed of trust. And people don't, a lot of people don't even use, know the word deed of trust yeah. is different than a mortgage, but also very, similar. Very, very similar. Right, the only difference is, well, well let's, go, let's go through this high level. So how do we know who the owner of a property is? Their name is on the deed, okay? So deed, take the word deed. If I want to, if I'm the owner of a property, it means I have the deed, right? My name is on the deed. If I want Jerry to be the owner of the property, I literally can sign the deed over to Jerry and Jerry is now the new owner of the property. Now, people also misunderstand the word title and deed, yeah. okay? So think about this, it's a very easy way to understand it. Deed is who, who owns the property and title is how they hold the ownership, right? So title could be like tenants in common or these types of things, that is title. The deed, like if I go look up county records and I wanna see who the owner of the property is, I'm not looking up title, I'm looking up who has their name on the deed. So the deed is the receipt of ownership. So the and it could be multiple people, it could be right. entity, it could be these different things mm -hmm. that, and that's the title. Right, and if Jerry and I go and, there you go, that's it. So if Jerry and I wanted to own a property together, his, my LLC and his LLC would be both named on the deed as the owners of that property or the named owners, but then how we hold that property, whether it's tenants in common or sole proprietorship or a partnership or those types of things, that's title. Yeah, right? and different states have different things with how marriage works, there right? So there's these different ways that that you can hold the deed, but the deed is the ownership of the property, and that gets recorded. Right. And there's a history of that too. That's very what, important. When you say recorded, this is also a common thing that people misunderstand. I'm glad you're bringing that what up. What does that mean? What does that mean? What right? does it mean that it's recorded? Okay, so every single county in the in the country have has a recorder's office, right? Where we um, you can record, you can see permits that are being pulled. You can see the most amazing data ever. Like if Jerry gave me a personal loan and he says, well, how do I make sure that you're gonna pay me back? How do I make sure I have security with that loan? I go, well, why don't you record that loan against my property as a lien? That document shows up at the county recorder's office as public data. Yeah, it's notice to the world. Yes. It's letting the public know by that recording because now anybody can look it up. Right, my wife did a video about this about two months ago on her YouTube channel, mm -hmm. where she goes, watch me go record a document at the recorder's office. It costs $17 in an hour of your time. Yeah. So you can record just about You can anything. walk down there with it and they'll. Right, it takes about, uh, so you can record it, let's say today's Monday. By the end of the week, it'll show up on public record that there's a recorded document against that property, which is great, yeah. right? So, um, now, let's say that I, you know, long, long, long time ago, they started creating financing, right? Back at like thousands of years ago, it was like I had to trade 17 goats for, to buy a shack. <laughs> but then banks came in, they go, man, we can loan people money and they'll pay us interest. And then they created the 30-year mortgage. And people are like, wait, what the heck is a mortgage? Well, a mortgage is our ability to go buy something with the bank's money, right? And that agreement of what your, uh, the, the, basically all the terms of that agreement are in that mortgage, but guess what? There's another confusing word. This is where people also get tripped up is that I, I, you could have a mortgage in some states, but other states it's not called a mortgage, it's called a deed of trust. And that's really simple Google to know what your state is if you don't know. Right, you should do it. But this is creative, not just creative finance, but real estate in general is very confusing because 
didn't we just say the deed is who the owner is, but then we also said that the deed of trust is a debt. They actually, these have nothing to do with each other, but yeah. they, they, they used a similar word deed in both of them so it can trip you up. It's very complicated. So what happened is a long time ago, people started using the word mortgage and deed of trust synonymously because it was more simple to just say mortgage but the reality is in Arizona, we're not a mortgage state, we're a deed of trust state. And people are actually are technically using that wrong when they say my mortgage. They're, they're actually referring to the loan, not the mortgage. Right. There is no mortgage in Arizona. It's a deed There's of trust. There's a loan, right? right? But So what you're saying is guys, commonly you're using the word mortgage incorrectly right. because the mortgage is a very specific instrument in the loan process. Right. And it's important to know that because if you don't understand the differences between these, these instruments, then you, how could you possibly do creative financing you if can. you don't understand these? And this, this, so this is where, this is a good breakthrough for people is that I always ask people, I'll ask people today on stage, where both you and I are speaking at a big event with like 1,500 people today. And um, I'll ask people, I'll go, have you ever bought groceries at a grocery store with a credit card? And people go, yeah, of course, we do that all the time. I go, great, so you're going through the cashier, cashier tells you what you owe, you pull out your credit card, is that your money? And people are like, no, that's actually somebody else's money. That's American Express's money, right? It's not my money. American Express just approved me to use their money. That's what a credit card is. American Express approved me to use their money. They didn't give me money. They gave me the approval to use their money and pay them back at a later date. That's a credit card. Mm -hmm. So um, essentially, I'm pulling out my credit card. I pay for that bag of groceries. And now the cashier's job is to transfer the ownership to me. How do they do that? Well, they take the receipt and they hand it to me and they go, you are now the lawful owner of the property, the groceries. And so the receipt of those groceries is the deed. Okay, so in real estate, the receipt is the deed. I can give, this is what's crazy, I can give the groceries to Jerry and the receipt and guess who the new owner of those groceries and receipt are? Jerry. Jerry even though the money is still owed to American Express. Yeah, Jerry doesn't owe American Express. You still owe American Express. There you go. And so you have to realize that the debt I owe more um, American Express is not the ownership. American Express doesn't own my groceries. I own my groceries because I have the receipt. But there's an agreement between American Express and me, the owner. And in real estate, that is called a promissory note. There, it is literally a note, one document usually, one piece of paper. It's a note that I promise to pay American Express back. Therefore, we call it a promissory note. And that promissory note is the agreement between the two parties. And that includes things like interest rates, due dates, penalty, yep. when it gets paid off, all of the things pertaining to that agreement, mm -hmm. right? But where the mortgage or deed of trust now comes into factor is that now there's a security, there's a security, right. right? So if you think about American Express, what's interesting is there is no security, right? Because if let's say that you let's say that you um, don't pay that money back from the groceries, right? right? They're not going to come repossess those groceries because they did not collateralize the groceries to the payment. It's an unsecured loan now you have with American Express. Now you'll wreck your credit and cause all kinds of other problems in your life right. if you don't pay it back. But in real estate, that's the powerful thing about um, Chase, Bank of America, Zions Bank, whoever, is they give you the money, right? They approved you to go buy a house with their money. What they're doing is they're putting that agreement, that mortgage against the property in the form of a lien in first position. They're the first position holder it means you're the owner, you have the receipt or the deed in your name, but the mortgage company who let you buy this house with their money, they go, if you fail to make this payment, we have the right to take the property back and sell it to get our cap capital back. So the mortgage or deed of trust is collateralizing or securitizing the promissory note. It's right. basically saying, in the event that I default on this note, I'm giving Chase or Wells Fargo or Bank of America, whoever the lien holder is, I'm giving them, I'm agreeing that they can repossess the asset that they collateralize the loan with, Yeah. right? So it's important to understand that, that, that there's two documents, the promissory note, but the mortgage or deed of trust, depending on your state, is what securitizes that loan. And that's what makes real estate such an amazing asset because you can securitize the actual property 
to the loan. It's what, it's what makes real estate the greatest investment of all time. The best. Because you can't do that with a lot of other, and you, you don't securitize stocks. Right. Right? Right. You know what's interesting is this is a weird analogy, but when I hear the word lean, here's what I think of in my brain. I used to be a painter, and I know you've done a lot of construction as well. Yeah. And I would watch my paint, my paint crews, they would put a, a big tall ladder up against the property and they would lean the ladder up against the property. And when my painter would wanna come and spray that portion of the house, he'd have to remove the ladder or the lean against the property in order to paint. Mm. And so a lean, Great analogy. right? So I look at this ladder leaning against the property. It's like, I can't do anything with this house until the ladder is pulled off. So think about a ladder up against a property as a lean. So when somebody says, well, I need a personal loan, Jerry. Jerry, will you give me 50 grand? Jerry goes, yeah, if you let me put a lien against the property so you can't do anything with it until you pay me my 50 grand back. That's how I learned lien. Yeah. I learned all this stuff through thinking and anal- through analogies, like a leaned ladder prevents me from doing things on that side of the house. And these mortgage and deeds of trust, they prevent me, the owner, the guy who own- holds the receipt. I can't do anything with this property um, I can't refinance it and I can't sell it without paying off that debt is what I believed. I believed that for a very long time and I realized that as long as somebody is willing to take over that debt in the exact situation it's in, I could transfer the ownership over. And I, when I had that epiphany, I was like, Game changer. You're joking me. Yeah. And like the third deal I ever did, okay, there was, this is really ironic. Okay, there was a, a guy who got a divorce and he was going through a hard time and he owned this property and had no equity. He's an agent, by the way, too. And he says, I would love, I go, I'll, I'll buy your house subject to. And he goes, I can't sell it to you subject to because I have, um, not only do I owe Wells Fargo my loan, I go, I can take that over, no problem. Yeah. He goes, well, I have a problem. I have a painting company that charged me 15 grand and I never paid them. They have a lien against my property. A mechanics lien. A mechanics lien. Mm-hmm. And ironically, I was like, I already knew the painting ladder scenario. I was like, oh, I can take over that lien. I'm okay with a ladder leaning up against that property. And so I call, I took over not only his first position loan, but I took over a mechanics lien in second position. And I didn't have to make payments on that paint thing for like six years. And then when I finally sold the property, I called the painting company and go, I know you're owed 15 grand plus penalties and blah, blah, blah. I'll pay you 2,500 bucks. And, and they're, they're like, something's it. better than nothing. They yeah. took it. Yeah, They took it. So when you understand these little things like first position, second position, third position, you, you it's like playing Monopoly with like your own. So piece. Pace, going back to this uh, deed that gets recorded, meaning it's now noticed to the public. Right. It's at the county level. Mm-hmm. Everywhere we go, it's at the county level. That now puts that... Uh, ownership of that property. And if you're the lender, you're the bank, or in this case, a mechanics lien, you also record that lien on the property. So now when they do what's called a title search, mm-hmm. they're going to look at what's what's publicly no, on notice about that property. So you're going to see liens and, and the positions. So positions is important because in the event that Pace gets hit by a bus and they sell the asset, who gets paid back? Well, it's, in, it's based on priority. So the first lien position, it's not split evenly by everybody. First lien position gets all their money first. If there's any money left over, a second lien position would get all their money. If there's a third, and so whatever's left is, is based on lien priority. So think about it this way. I've got a, let's say I go buy a truck, right? And I go to Jerry and I go, hey, Jerry, I want to buy this F-150, right? And Jerry goes, yeah, I'll get, what do you need? And I go, I need 20 grand. The, the cost of it is 20 grand. And Jerry goes, well, it's only worth 20 grand, but sure, I'll give you 20,000 bucks. So Jerry gives me 20. I now owe Jerry $20,000, right? There's a, an agreement between the two of us called the promissory note, mm-hmm. okay? So Jerry then says, we put an agreement together that says if I go to sell that truck or I refinance it or I crash it in the future, the insurance payout doesn't come to me, it goes to Jerry before I get anything, okay? So let's say three months later, I decide I want new wheels and new tires, and I want a new audio system. So I go to my other buddy, Jamil, and I go, Jamil, will you loan me 10 grand? Soup up this truck. Let's soup up this truck that's only worth 20 grand. <laughs> in first, who's in first position? Jerry. Jerry. Who's in second position? 
Jamil. Jamil, because he it's always an order of recorded date. Okay, so Jerry recorded his his uh, deed or not his deed, but his deed of trust or his mortgage or his the debt first. J- Jamil came in second. So let's say I go off and I get in a wreck in this truck. My insurance company goes, okay, we see the truck is worth twenty grand. Who's getting paid? Jerry. Jerry's getting paid twenty grand because he's in first position. Guess what? Jamil is S O L. So typically, you don't want to be in second position unless it, there, there's something in it for you or you understand the risk. It's higher risk, yeah. It's higher risk. And let's say, you, let's say because of those upgrades, you were able to sell it for 25. There you go. Jamil would have gotten five. He would have gotten five, Jerry 20. So Jerry gets paid first. First lien position gets paid first. And that's why most banks will only be first lien position right. because they want to protect their interest. Right. So in this situation, Jerry was the bank in real estate, right? That's the bank. I go to him for a first position. I then go to Jamil as a private money lender or hard money lender in second position because they're willing to do more risky loans at a higher interest rate. So, And I think it's important to say here, it doesn't mean second lien, third lien, junior lien positions are bad oh. because they could have a ton of equity and they're you're still really protected. Right. It's all about the deal, the position, the equity, but these second and third lien positions can be amazing instruments, which we'll talk about. Yeah. But it's just, right now, we're just trying to really focus on understanding how these instruments play a role yeah. in so real estate. You've got, you know, you've got the paperwork that needs to make, make sure you're straight and, and narrow. And people will ask these questions, especially in creative finance, first position, second position, third position, and sometimes a fourth position will pop up where there's additional lenders and you just need to understand the order like the jerry thing with the truck helps a lot i tell people that story and they go i didn't understand it in real estate but now i understand it in general and now it makes me understand it in real estate too if i go down to the bank and get a loan they're in first position if i go get a home equity line of credit they're in second position against the property because i now want to do improvements and i think it's important that people understand too that the government supersedes all lien priority Yes. In other words, if Wells Fargo's in first lien position, but you don't pay property taxes, mm-hmm. the, the state or county could foreclose on non-payment for property taxes and override the bank's first position, which is why the banks will step in and pay that. Right. So here's, here's where this comes in handy. We'll talk about sub two and seller finance coming up next in the next video. But let's say I find a seller that has no equity in the house and the seller says, hey, I've got this loan with Wells Fargo. 3%, my payment's 1500 bucks a month. I'll literally let you take that over and I'll transfer the deed to you. You therefore are the new owner. That's subject to. But I want you to pay for my moving expenses, which are five grand. And, I, and now I also, as the buyer, I got to pay the closing costs. Crap. Okay, well, I'm brand new. What do I do in that situation? That's probably $10,000 I got to come up with. Grand. I don't have 10 grand. Well, option one, you could wholesale it to Jerry or to me or thousands of other creative finance buyers. Or two, you can go get a private money lender that brings 10 grand to the table, kind of like Jamil did in that truck scenario, mm-hmm. and says, I'll give you the 10 grand and I'm willing to go in second lien position as long as you make me a monthly payment, right? So this is why it's important for you to understand first lien position, second lien position, and where that money comes from. In fact, I just did a deal where an agent got paid, a wholesaler got paid, I paid the closing costs and furnished an Airbnb, the Airbnb, all with a private money lender that was willing to go into second lien position, and I'm in the deal with no money out of pocket. In fact, another scenario that's really great example is a lot of my fix and flip deals, mm-hmm. I do first lien, second lien, where I use hard money in first lien position because they'll give me 80% of the money you know, purchase and repairs. Mm -hmm. Well, now I'm short 20,000 or 20%, let's just say 20%. Now I'll go to a private money lender and I'll say, hey, give me the remaining 20%, I'm short. I'll pay you whatever, right? Interest and whatever. But now you're in a second lien position behind the hard money lender, which now allows me to be 100% financed on the deal. But again, I can't put a deal like that together unless I understand first and second lien positions, how notes work, how how a mortgage or a deed of trust works, so that you can get all these all this yeah. paperwork put together. And I in was a, um, so people ask me why did it take me so long to get into real estate, and you want to know why? Why? Because I didn't understand what you just explained. Literally, what Jerry just explained kept me the the missing. This thing, is where you did a thousand deals for other flippers. I did seven thousand renovations yeah. for Open Door, Offerpad, Zillow, and other flippers before I ever did a deal for myself. Because, because you I thought didn't, you had to have the cash. I thought I had to have the cash. 
I didn't understand first and second lean positions, which we're explaining to you now, where I'm like, okay, I get the hard money. I get the hard money. I can go to a hard money lender, but that sounds like a mobster, hard money. Yeah. And nobody sat here and explained it to me and go, dude, there's literally thousands. There's probably more hard money lenders than there are Starbucks offices, okay? Literally, there's that many hard money lenders. And so you can go to a hard money lender for your first lean position, and then you go to a private money lender that gives you your second lean position. And the last, I don't know, 700 flips, I've never used a penny of my own money. I wish I could jump into a time machine 20 years ago and tell myself, dude, you literally don't need any money of your own. You need to understand first lean position, second lean position, and where that money comes from. It's interesting. I I, uh, I did a deal recently where the hard money loan I did was like 500000 was the hard money portion. And then the other part that I used private money for was like 100000 mm-hmm. And I'm talking to this private money lender, and I said, uh, I said, yeah, you're going to be in second position with your 100000 but it's okay. There's lots of equity. You're, you're, you're still protected with a lien, but you're... And they said, well why would I take a second lien position? And I said, well, if you have the 500,000 and you want to be first lien position, we can do that. Right. And they're like, well, I don't have 500, I have 100. That's why you're second lien position. Right. right? And so they, they're like, I get it. Okay, I get it. Yeah, I'm willing to take a little higher risk by being in second lien position because I'm getting my 100 grand to work and I don't have enough capital to to beat the first lien position hard money lender. What I find with private money too, this is a whole nother video you and I could make at some point in the future is like, where does private money come from? But the people that are in my world that lend our private money are people that are like doctors, lawyers, attorneys, traveling nurses, engineers, whatever, people that make over six figures. They don't have any time to invest in real estate, but they wanna learn and be part of a real estate deal. And so I call them, um, they're like beginner swimmers. They're like, they wanna become a a loan shark but right now they're just like little guppies and they go, teach me. Like, I want to be part of a successful transaction. So most private money lenders- And a lot of them have um, IRA money that's just sitting there that can be- Doing nothing. Yeah. And so what they'll do is they'll go, man, not only am I going to get a good return that's safe, even if it's in second position, it's a very safe, secure loan, but I get to learn how did, where did the deal come from? How is Jerry doing the deal? How is he blah, 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 blah. How did he exit the deal? you'll get a million dollar education. So the people that are private money lenders are typically individuals that want to learn or be part of successful real estate transactions. Those are people. Hard money lenders are businesses that are like, this is what we do for a living. We lend money, right? And this is important because I think Pace, you know, in the perfect world, you put together, create a financing deal and it's 100% finance, zero out of pocket. You do a ton of these deals. It's incredible to see you do all these deals where literally it's zero out of pocket. Yeah. But there are some cases where it's still a creative financing deal and there's some money needed to yeah. put put the deal together and being able to pull in this outside private money. It's, it's about 70% of the deals I do requires that. Yeah. 30% of the deals I do don't require any of it. And um, I do those, they're a lot of fun and they're great, but you're not gonna get that 70% of the time. You need to understand where you're pulling money from. And it might be five grand, 10 grand or whatever it is. Usually it's not a lot of money, but being able to leverage other people's money to then come in and, and, and meet that, that part that is cash right. can help you really put these deals together. And at the end of the day, you're still 100% finance. It's still zero out of pocket. You just were able to leverage existing debt, bring in some private money. And so becoming one of these, you know, structuring engineers is like how you really we call can it, blow we up call this it business. a transaction year. Oh, love that. Yeah, transaction year. So you're you're engineering a transaction and you're looking at the pieces that are there and you go, okay, the seller has a first lien with Wells Fargo. Seller wants 20 grand. Wholesaler brought the deal to me, wants 10 grand. I gotta get the furniture for the Airbnb. Okay, I need. I call that my entry fee. All the all the capital that's needed to make the deal work, and where do I get that from? I go to a private money lender or even a partner, okay, depending on what resources and relationships you have. I could bring in a private money lender and create a second note, and now I have two loans on the property. The first p- position I took over sub two, the second position we created a seller finance note, or not a seller finance note, but a, a private money note. Or when I first started, I didn't understand it. So what I was doing is I was partnering with people. Partnering, yeah. And if I knew that, I wouldn't have been giving away so much stinking profit. I used to give away 50% of my profits to the private money lenders. And I go, wait, there's such thing as second lien position. Yeah, debt versus equity. Yeah. Well, 
you know, Pace, Pace, I think like your number one asset, and I would probably say this about me as well, is your ability to structure deals. Mm -hmm. And when you're new, that's overwhelming, but it's like reps, you know, put the reps in, really so learn. Is, I mean, so is comping a cash deal that's when, right, you're, comping, when you're first new. When you're first new, it feels overwhelming, but when you, I think if you could learn real estate and really learn how to structure, when I, and when I say structure, it's all this stuff. It's being able to pull these different things and put stuff together and walk out of there with this amazing deal that's kicking out cash flow mm -hmm. or whatever it is you're going to do with that deal. Three things you can do with a, with a creative finance deal is you can wholesale it, you can fix and flip it, or you can buy and hold it. You can do anything with creative finance. So whatever it is that you decide to do, what you've got to do is you've got to figure out and put all the pieces on the table, right? You've got to see what what's their existing debt. If they don't have existing debt, well then we're going to have to create some existing debt. And we'll talk about that in the seller finance video yeah. coming up. Yeah. So guys, this is really exciting. Learn how to be a structure. Transaction. Tra transaction. Learn how to be a trans. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay, guys, if you have any questions about any of the instruments or lean position or any of that we talked about, leave a comment. We want to make sure you're clear about this. You, you really can't go into these next things and we're not going to be able to like explain every time we say lean position or note or whatever. So be sure to really make sure you got your head around this so that these other strategies will make a lot of sense. So our next video, guys, watch in the series here. The next video, we're going to actually dive into the first creative financing strategy, which is seller financing or owner financing. And we'll do a deep dive on that one. So watch for that video. We'll see you on the next video.